Hello all, my name is Philip Motueri. I'm the editor at large for Vogue Greece. I'm a published author and a fashion curator as well as a photographer. Um, dear audience, friends and fashion enthusiasts, it's a, my great honor and my joy to welcome Haider Ackerman to Polymoda's Duets. Um, Haider Ackerman has been redefining the female and more recently the male silhouette with great sophistication. And he's known as one of the most uh, praised designers within the fashion industry for 20 solid years. Hello, Haider, welcome. It's so nice to see you again. Um, it's been almost a year already. I think that the last time we saw each other in person was backstage at your show. Um, it was a moment when it became clear that we had to deal with something that was beyond our power. And to be honest with you, I haven't traveled uh, for fashion ever since. How has this past year been for you? And um, how are you coping with the pandemic that emerged on a personal level to begin with? But also how this has affected your ways of working, or let's say the ways you apply your creativity? Well, you know, it's been, we had a few lockdowns, so it's not been one, but it's been several one. But I have to say the first lockdown was the um, introspection, which can be either very tormenting, but it can be also very stimulating for each of us. So this whole questioning, and, and it's been a surreal moment, which is, which we have not known before. So it was beyond our imagination that we all could be locked in the way we were. But I'm somewhere, I'm convinced that the boredom and the silence and the retreat, um, they are all source of benefits. Do you know what I mean? It, it's all, we have all to question ourselves and to reflect and in search for new values. So this process was really, really interesting. It, it, and it made us somewhere very humble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and on, on the work level, I mean, for me, I had conversation with my team on Zoom and this new approach was perhaps even more focused on the work mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there's no time to lose. We had those moments to spend together and you don't want to spend and this out in front of the screen. So every conversation was just almost calculated and like mathematics, we would go straight to the subject and go straight to where we would like to have a conversation going. Mm -hmm. And I personally really enjoyed this moment. Yeah. Was it an easy transition for you, this change? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. yes, because it, it, because it's been a luxury to, to, it is a luxury to be bored. You know, for people like us in our industry, it is a luxury to, to be silent and to listen to oneself. Uh, so I really embraced it, totally. Mm -hmm. So in a way you're saying that, you know, COVID-19 compelled the fashion industry for a restart, let's say. Um, having said that, what is left for fashion to tell at this specific moment? This continuous situation where collections keep on being presented when we're still locked in our homes. Well, you, you know, I, there was this, I took part of this group of individual designers, independent designers, sorry, and independent retailers which was led by Business of Fashion, by Tim Blanks and uh, Imran, and where we discussed all like um, how the industry was going and if there would be a healthy way to do um, the timing, the, 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 the amount of collections, the deliveries. So to have all those, to have this, this period standing still, it was all for all of us a moment to reflect, how could we do it differently? How could we think differently? So the approach was really very noble. I think that at the end, it would not be a collective um, solution, but everybody individual had to think about their own house, how to lead it forward. And um, 
And that's been very, very interesting. That's been very, each maison will now find its own path the way they would like to continue. Mm -hmm. And to conclude this on a, on a personal level, how would you describe um, this period we're in, in terms of aesthetics and theory? Because we make this stop, as you so nicely described, but at the same time, we need to be productive. As and I, I think this is just a moment for each of us to be even more recenter on your aesthetics. You know, more than ever, figure out who you are, what you would like to be, and where you would like to go. More mm. than ever. So mm. it's, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. How has the current crisis impacted our general relationship to clothing and fashion? You know, the fact that um, the consumer has been locked in. Uh, there is no social event. There is no mundanity going on. Uh, so a part of a dream has been removed. Basically, that's, that's how I feel. It. The difference the always permitted um, to step out of the commercial part. You were, selling, you were selling a story next to the clothes. The garments were not only the garments. And all this imagination, it led to an artistic direction, which was needed. So, because fashion should be seen and should be felt and should be touched. And so, because of not having all this, because people are locked in, we don't have this anymore. We don't have this fantasy anymore. And, it, um, and in those moments, you know, when you have a, a defile, the, the garment is not just a garment. It's, just, it's not just a garment. There's a whole story behind it. And I do believe it is very important because fashion, fashion is a language. Fashion is a community. And the moment that you have defiles is the moment that People were together, people were feeling the same, people were exchanging ideas, people were getting excited, and all this makes, makes it all alive. Mm. So, yes. Yeah. And looking at this from a, a more general perspective and the role of fashion at this, you know, at this very moment, especially, um, it's, it's individual expression and liberation role in our changing society due to a pandemic uh, as such. Um, is it really, uh, is there really an impact, do you think, or not? Is there uh, really a place for fashion at this moment? Is it a priority as it used to be? It is. It, it, it needs to... Fashion is a necessity. Fashion is like... It's culture. Culture is essential. We need, we need to read. We need to listen to music. We need to look at movies. We need to feel alive to all those expressions. So it is an essential necessity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what about rebellion? And because it all, it, it all leads to a dream. And that dream can bring us. So please, let's keep on dreaming. Oh, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, back in the, in the 1980s, for example, we experienced designers uh, making statements through fashion, like we had um, Jean-Charles de Castelbajac, or we had someone like Catherine Hamlet, that they, they used this, you know, large printed t-shirts with all these, carrying all these messages, um, and they were considered to be rebellions at the time. What does rebellion look like in fashion these days? What does it mean to you as a leading brand in the industry to be rebellious and what is the outcome um, um, a rebellion is aiming for? Well, perhaps not in, in my case, perhaps not as a leading brand, but in, in independent brands. And for being an independent brand to, to express yourself, to be out there, to continue and above all to stay is being rebellious already in itself to, to be confronted and to, to confront the others with your aesthetics and your ideas. Um, it is being rebellious. And I think it, it is needed. It is important for me 
to exist. Um, yeah. And being in fashion hider for 20 years, that's a very long time. So I'm, I would like to ask you to, if possible, for, for, for you to, to compare, um, let's say, um, the current state of fashion system um, to the days when you launch, when you first launch your brand as a young designer? Well, you know, I, 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 I certainly do not like to compare, but I have to say at the same time, um, when I was a student, it was the 90s, um, which I refer as the golden age because everything was possible. Everything was possible and the, there was a pleasure of freedom and eccentricity, a decadence. Everyone wanted to be individual. Um, and I navigated through this period with a lot and lots of excitement. It's, you know, as a student, you were going from a John Galliano show to Helmut Lang to a Comme des Garçons. It was surreal. It was surreal. And the models were those fascinating chameleons. So you had this search for extreme individuality, which is more strong than what we ever feel now. Yeah. Not that I'm nostalgic about this period, but there was a period where there was no judgment. Everybody could be their own. I think it was much more stimulating time uh, than it is now. And oh. I think uh, the oh. icons have not, changed. Nothing was reduced. Nothing was reduced and, and, and there was a total freedom and freedom, freedom means it's having no fears. So you were totally liberated from everything and, and not judged by all the excitement that life can bring or cannot bring and all the destruction that life can bring or not bring. So there was all these explosions. Yeah. Having said that, Haider, do you think there's a, a chance that we return to that sort of innocence or not we, we we can we cannot return to what it used to be or what it was and we should leave it where it was because that makes that appear very extraordinary but i'm I, I i do believe that we need to search for more open doors mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. more openness and something that has changed since then it, it, it for a long time people would would think of fashion as a place of exclusivity, huh? Mm -hmm. Should should fashion have followership limitations? And if so, I mean, who puts these limitations at the end? Well, you know, I, I, I did. I personally did not mind the exclusivity of fashion, and I think it was very interesting back in the days to wanting to belong to a certain gang or family. Mm -hmm to desire, to be a part of, of this community. Um, now the open doors killed all the desire because you can have everything in a second, in a minute, and yeah. part of it. So the, the longing to, or the longing of, to belong somewhere, yeah, is gone. So, yeah. mm. It somehow vanished. Yeah, it, we are we are playing by different rules now. But the fact that, the fact that you have access to everything now killed something. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned before at the time in the nineties, you said you were a student. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you, what is the role of education in who you have become? What are the values, let's say, that you still carry from? you know, your days as a, as a fashion student, how did it form you? Yeah, you, as you know, I studied in Antwerp, so I think the big lesson I learned there uh, is that as a designer, you should always think who is the person you have in front of you and how much you respect this person. So it is not the garments who are wearing the clothes, but it's vice versa. Mm -hmm. And and you you had to be focused. There was this sobriety of the Flemish school, where no no decoration was needed. So 
all of this language, of course, me coming from a past which used to be in Africa, where everything was all about the creation. And I want to ask you about that later, yes. And the audience of colors and everything. I was reduced to something which was much more narrow, but much more focused on the garment. And I guess the soberness of the Flemish school did me very well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how, how much time did it take you to actually, um, let's say, clarify the in your head the direction that you wanted to, to follow? Do you think that your aesthetics were already planned? Or was it something that happened eventually? It's an evolution. It happens with the time and what you're going through. And it defines, you know, we all going through different periods and all this affects our work, whether you might be in love then you're closer, you're going to be more generous, or whether you might be in a period where you're more scared, you, you will be more introvert, everything would be feel more protected. So it all depends on every different stage of life that you went through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and speaking of students, I am often uh, asked, let's say, what makes a fashion collection great? Um, as you know, we know each other for quite a long time. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an observer of fashion. I'm a writer, a photographer. And hence, my perspective is, is much different than yours. To you, as a, as a fashion designer, what makes a great collection apart from being sellable? A courageous one. Mm -hmm. One with no compromise. One where the designers has that story to tell, and he will go until the end to tell it. Mm. Does it really take courage to present a collection during Fashion Week with all these critics and all these people? It, it takes courage. It takes courage. At the end of the show, you are naked in front of an audience, and it is the most strangest moment where suddenly everything is done. You've been working all those months for those five minutes, the applause is done and you're standing all by yourself in this moment of absolutely solitude. One needs to face, yeah, it takes courage to face all the criticism and all the, all the eyes that are on you. It sounds, it's courageous, but it's the most wonderful feeling. Don't get me wrong. It is this moment of solitude. It's, it's a desired one, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as not much is said about your early references, I know you don't like this question. <laughs> uh, what was the social context of your childhood in terms of fashion references? You mentioned before Africa and I interrupted you. So guide us through your early references and early um, experiences that inspired you to become who you are today. You know, the, the strange thing is, I never thought of being a fashion designer. I, when you live in the, those countries that I lived in, um, I was simply seduced by the meats of fabrics that surrounded me. You know, I, I live in Chad, I live in Ethiopia, I live in Algeria. And women are wrapped and covered in meat fabrics, whether it's protection of the body, whether it's protection of the sun, whether it's protection of the soul, whether it's protection for men. And I never knew who would be, I was always curious who would be this woman underneath all those meat fabric. So that discovery and that to try to understand it, that was what I was seduced by or curious or intrigued by and never knowing that this would lead to me to be a fashion designer. Mm. But it was just those meat the fabrics in the wind and those ghosts in Medina were running along the walls and that whole mystery was seductive to me. Mm -hmm. It was the whole questioning like what is a woman? What, what is this all about? And, and what was the moment when it actually became an interest 
to the point that you actually decided that it was your calling, let's say, and you embraced it as a creative career. And, um, and also to what was achieved gradually, if you can walk me through your personal development that okay. came in parallel to your work, because you mentioned it before, your work development, how did one help the other? Let's start with the first part of the question, uh, the moment when you decide to become a designer and then what followed? You know, I, I, I don't know, I do not recall the moment that I decided to be a designer. I think it was, it was a continuation of everything because I have the luxury to have had all those visions and in images and they are anchored in me. They are part of me. So then it was automatically in my first collection, how would I trans translate who I am and what I am about? Not in the first degree, it's all like a mirage or in the back. So, but I'm wondering, was, was, were all these questions so clear in your head? Because these are very mature questions. Well, yeah, I, I don't know if at that time I really thought about this. <laughs> But, but now, as, as I certainly do, I, I, you know, you, what are you doing with all your luggage, you know? And especially when you have a nomadic life as I had, you carry your home with you. So you have everything on your shoulders. And that was the moment that I had to let a few things go also to be lighter. And, and then it was eventually, um, I had to become a designer. I had to do something with this. So how do I get rid of this? How do I express myself to, to lose nothing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and you told your parents, hey, I want to do this. And what did they say? Or how did you do it? Were you, were, was it you know, because of friends, your surroundings? No, no, nothing. Nothing in my surrounding or in my family's. Uh, would, might have approached me to, to this, to what fashion was, which I did not know what fashion was. I did not know uh, when I was uh, intrigued by all this, I didn't know that we exist a fashion industry. I think it's much later that I bumped into magazines where I found Monsieur Saint Laurent and Madame Gray and all that. And then I understood that everything that I was touching and all those meat fabric had a purpose. But when I was doing it, I did not understand that. Mm. So it took a while, then, and, and then I lived in, at that point, I lived in north of Holland, where I felt different, I had a different skin color. Diversity was not such a big word as it nowadays, so I was a French young dude coming from Colombia, not speaking Dutch at that moment, and being in north of Holland, being kind of lost, and not, certainly not being myself. So the only way to escape was to go to Amsterdam, which was like the big city at the age of 17, and try to taste life and what it would be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I want to ask you, um, you spoke up about um, um, cons consistency. Um, and indeed, there is a certain and calculated consistency in your signature. And I cannot help but wonder about the balance between refining the signature of Heider Ackerman each season and doing something new. I'm following your work for many years now. I've come to your shows for a long time. Um, I'm also backstage, I see the preparation. I think I see the clothes before anyone else. I mean, all of us being backstage, we have this privilege. This is my nervousness. <laughs> yes. Um, and there's something about your work that although it's consistent, it's always new. And you want to be that woman or you want to be that man wearing these clothes. Um, there's also a great respect towards the gender, but at the same time, the gender is not specific. Well, you know, you know, to, to refer back, there's nothing calculated about, about um, my consistency of signature. I am one of the designers who works in continuity. 
you know. I think my signature is more like a writing and, and you, you, you try to write down the story and you go from one paragraph to the other in the hope that every paragraph, which is every season, you will intrigue the audience for going to the next chapter. So I'm more in that league of those designs which are in a continuity. And you learn from every season, you learn something else from the past or you didn't, you, you, you could not finish this story. So you take it, you put it in a drawer and then you open the drawer again for the next season and you, and you rework it and you continue like this. And yes, this gender situation, um, it is not, it has not been in my case, a kind of questioning about genders. It was more questioning of desire and sexuality. How much do you like to wear as a woman, I imagine? How much do you like to wear the pullover of your lover? Mm -hmm. How much do you like to escape with his coat? How much as a man you like to have to take the, the shirt of your girlfriend, which is just a little bit too narrow, a little bit too tight, which can make the sleeve a little bit shorter, which can give you an attitude, which can give you a certain style, because everything is in a proportion. So my approach has always been more in a more loving sexual way. The exchange of garments to smell and to feel the other. Mm -hmm. So having said that, I'm wondering whether you're ever in conflict with your own taste and if you think of relevancy, for example, before you present or you create a collection. I'm always in conflict with myself. <laughs> <laughs> and with my own taste. Um, this is my personal driving force. Uh, and I hope it will be forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it, it kind of helps you to reborn or it's to... It's stimulating. It's stimulating thing to do yourself any kind of violence that, uh, that, that makes you think or make you twist and change your mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it would be quite boredom. Yeah. And having uh, and speaking about, you know, the rules of fashion and how the nature of fashion has changed uh, of course, with the social media and all these new elements that sort of define the new era. Um, would you say that it's possible for a brand to be successful today without being creative? Well, all I can say, it works and it exists. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it works and it exists. And previously we spoke about the audience attending your shows. Um, but, you know, on a wider scale, from a wider perspective, how do you hope that people understand your work? Or does it matter to you only that they, that they buy it? Does it matter to you for, for them to understand it, to feel connected to it? No. I do not need people to understand my work. Sometimes there's no explanation needed. Um, you know, once a closed leave the catwalk, it belongs to an audience. Mm -hmm. It belongs to them. And I, it's important that they buy it and they wear it and they make it their own and they transform it, they duplicate it, they destroy it with humor mm -hmm. and with seriousness and with love. And I think that, that's important. But Heider, how easy it is to disconnect yourself from a collection that you have been working on for at least six months? How I disconnect myself? Yes, is it easy? We never disconnect. I don't, I don't think that I know any design who disconnect. You always, somehow busy with it. You will go to the museum the next day to try to change your mind, to absorb something else. You will see a vase and you think, how can I translate this vase in my collection? So mm -hmm. you do never step back. You're always, your mind is always on the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't disconnect. <laughs> um, 
A lot is being said now about the importance of craft and, you know, the savoir faire, for example. I'm wondering how do you value the existence of it in what you do, of savoir faire, and how it, it resonates with your own philosophy of making fashion that is heading towards a full um, digitized future, let's say. Mm. Well, you know, the, the savoir faire and um, the time consuming and the work it takes is done most of the time with so much love mm. and so much passion by so many people. When you, for instance, look at how Haute Couture de Filet is built and how the craftsmanship and artisanal is there, one needs to be in love with this business to, to do it. And all of this has a strength. And there again, as I said before, you need to feel it, you need to touch it, you need to sense it. So yes, our um, the digital will not replace the emotion that you feel when you are there, mm -hmm. present. We need to find a new form. Mm -hmm. But you know, Haider, your, your, your clothes, the clothes that you create are, are impeccably made. I mean, um, they are. Uh, that's a compliment. <laughs> so I'm wondering how you haven't yet decided to move a step forward and engage yourself with haute couture, officially at least. That would be my wildest dream. Why don't you go for it? Who knows? <laughs> maybe, you're, maybe you're planning something. Who knows what tomorrow is made of? But yeah, to, to have this... Um, you know, I, I remember back in the days, look at Monsieur Christian Lacroix's haute couture. I mean, if one loves fashion, one needs to love this. Just to look at the garments from nearby. It's just, I do not like to compare fashion to art, but it's, 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 it's certainly kind of art form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But having said that, I think that there's a lack of appreciation from the general public in the making of fashion. Is there a way we can reverse that, you think, or not? How can we educate people about what really fashion is and the making of fashion is? at a time where everything is so ephemeral. What can we do to change that? Well, it, 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 it's a first a question which sounds odd, but it's first a question of educating the consumer because the consumer is taking so much space, so much space. And I think there's work to be done by the industry because now it's almost the consumer leading us. Well, it should be vice versa. And this has always been in the past. Um, but this said, the, you know, at the same time, there is no lack of appreciation when we see um, how much space this industry has in this world. Um, it is one of the biggest industries worldwide and it, um, it makes a huge and massive amount of people work in wealthy and poor countries. So it really takes place. And, um, you know, we would not say this about other industries, which makes a hard kicking and beat, like the music industry or like the cinema industry. So, yeah, all those industries give us a possibility to dream. So there is never, and should never be underestimated. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about your gaze. Um, to fashion, towards fashion. Do you look differently at the fashions you create than fashion in general or not? It's a very difficult question because I do not think in fashion terms. You know, fashion is a big word and I'm trying to understand what fashion means nowadays. Due mm. to social media and everything, fashion took a different turn than how I've been raised. So, 
more into question what is fashion, what is fashion nowadays and where would you like to bring it? it it's a big it's a big question and i think this is a very important question for all of us to ask each other nowadays mm -hmm. but um i'm not sure i know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um back to your work and and critique and how people observe what you do do you think fashion critique still matters to designers or, or to you are you curious to hear how others observe what you create um and perhaps what would be the reasons why these observations might interest you well it, it certainly still matters to me i'm open to any kind of criticism because criticisms can help you grow can help you move forward can disturb you can challenge you and all of this, it, it's, it's vital for me, it's a necessity. Um, as long as the criticism is founded and constructive mm -hmm. without any judgment. Mm -hmm. So yes, I'm, 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 I'm curious. What is the greatest lesson you learned from someone else's mistake? I can only learn from my mistakes. <laughs> So what would be the greatest lessons you have learned? Greatest lessons you have learned? You know, it, 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 it's, very, it's very important to dream. It's important to have your story because the, the dream is just the beginning of a whole story. And that's... Um, and one should never forget that. Whatever comes your way, one should never forget that. And as Yoko Ono said, like, Dream your dream alone, it's only a dream. Dream your dream together is reality. So you can never do this job alone. You need to be very well surrounded. But also you need to be in a very certain and hard reality and, um, and be prepared with surrounding yourself with the right people. Yeah, that's very important. That's such an important message. Um, I want to thank you, Haider, for this opportunity you have given me today and our audience at Polymoda. And I truly hope that we will see each other very soon in Paris at one of your shows, as we did before. Well, Philip, thank you so much. And thank you, Polymoda, to just listen to what I eventually have to say. And, um, and let's just, you know, seriously, let's embrace this moment. And it's going to... We're all going to come strong out of it and we're going to come out with our strong values and it's a passage we have to go through, but it's a good one. Despite what's happening, um, all this reflection is necessary. So, and then we see each other very, very soon.